The scriptures mention the harlot numerous times throughout its writings. The fate of the harlot is outlined in the book of Revelations, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast. These shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. Rev 17.16 In scripture the harlot is usually described as drunken, perverse, seductive, filthy, rich, and sitting in the seat of power. She is also described as a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth, and the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation chapter 17 verse 18 There has been much debate over the actual identity of this metaphoric woman. We will delve into the book of Nahum, the prophet, to uncover the truth about the harlot. In the last days we will see that the woman is ultimately a description of the nation ruling the earth at the time of the end. Remember Satan is the god of this world, and to whom he will he can grant great authority and rulership on earth. These rulers are chosen because they have opened themselves up to demonic possession and have the mind of Satan, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. But the catch is, when you dance with the devil, you must pay the pipe. Welcome, family, to another edition of Stranger Thinking Media. This is Yeshayahu, where we address the problems of the modern world. So stay tuned. We have an awesome show for you today. Unveiling the Harlot, a deep dive into revelations in the book of Nahum. Topics covered, introducing the harlot of revelation, drunkenness, seduction, and power, unmasking the harlot's true identity, and then topic four, the grand finale. So stay tuned. Welcome to our channel. Please like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. And most of all, sit back and enjoy. You might learn something. Nahum chapter three and verse four. Because of the multitude of thy whoredoms, of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcrafts that selleth nations through her whoredoms, and families through her witchcraft. Sounds like she's in the slave game. So anyway, today we're going to discuss, and I've done videos on this topic before, of uh, the woman that rides the beast. And uh, if, you, if you were to watch those other videos, you'd see that there was a, uh, the, the way to describe the woman is as if it were a city, uh, a city that was rich and had grown rich and powerful and was riding the beast. Well, the beast we've discovered, uh, if you've watched my previous videos, is the Roman Empire, the Roman beast. And the Roman Empire is an empire or a beast, that's the final beast. It's a, it's a conglomeration of the, the beasts before it. And it's more powerful. It's made of iron, so it breaks in pieces. So it's like a tool. It's a tool of Asatan, right? And so we, it's pretty clear it's the Roman Empire. You know, it doesn't take much study to figure that one out. Um, but... Today, most people think of the city um, because, you know, in the description, and if you look up today, you, your thoughts go to a certain um, system that, that is the system of the beast. Uh, remember, Babylon starts off the beast empires, right? You know, Babylon, uh, Medo-Persia, uh, Greco-Macedonian, and then it culminates in the Roman Empire, but this is the beast that was, is not, and yet is. So in the last days, it appears again. It's just not called the Roman Empire, yet it's the same people groups that form the actual Roman Empire, and we seem not to get that. You know, the Most High lives forever, so an hour, I mean, a million years is like a, a two seconds to him, you know. So he... In his mind, it's the same beast. It's, I don't care that, it, that human beings 
call it by a different name or several names or look at it as a multitude of nations, it acts as one and it's given its power over to Ashatan, right? Or it gets its power from Ashatan, right? Anyway, it, uh, so who, who, what is the system of this Roman beast? And we did a video on that. The, I call it the uh, three major city-states of the world. Um, but it operates through those uh, entities. But it's an actual system. It's a religious system. It's a military system. And it's an economic-slash-financial system. So the spiritual part, you could say simply, what is the religion of the Roman beast? Well, once you know the nations that are of that, then you can kind of guess what the system of the Roman beast is, the, the, the religious system. So everybody focuses on the religious system, not thinking that it's more than just a religious system. It's a combined total effort, a three-pronged attack uh, by Ashitan against humanity. And of course, the, the group that does his bidding the best gets rewarded with uh, temporal, physical riches. So that nation, a group of nations, are probably the richest on earth. Um, and, and once you understand, uh, and I, I don't want to delve into it now, but there's a lot of prophecies about Esau in the end times. So and in previous, in the book of Jasher, it basically alludes that the Roman, the children of Esau sit atop the Roman beast. Um, and I say that, and I'm not going to go into it, but you, you have to understand. So there's a system in place. And in the book of uh, Second Ezra, it says, basically, it's the kingdom of Esau will reign until the very end, until the return of Christ. So once you understand what that means, it, it puts everything in a whole new perspective. So anyway, uh, yeah, so there's a system in place, right? And it's called the, the harlot or the whore that rides the beast, the whore of Babylon. So the operating system of the Roman beast is Babylon. But now in my other video, it talked about the great city and the great city um, or the one that rides the beast, it said that the Messiah would be killed in that city or just outside that city. Well, that would equate to Jerusalem, right? So which is it? Is it Rome or is it Jerusalem, you know? Or is there, there more to it? Is it more just a, a relationship-wise, meaning it could be any city, but at the time of the end, the city or the capital, if you will, or the, uh, wherever that power is emanating from, that becomes the, the, the whore of Babylon. It, does that make sense? What I'm saying is it's not so much a location as it is a power. And wherever that power is residing or emanating from, that is the woman. And it's generally you know, equated to a city. But then the city is equated to a nation, which is equated to an empire, to, you know, and blah, blah. So I think it's written a certain way to give you more of the idea. So it's not necessarily a city that we would recognize today unless we look at the description. Where is the power coming from for this Roman beast? What city, what country, who is it? So we're going to try to uh, do a little bit more of a deep dive into what this might be. And uh, maybe we don't know, but there's some, there's some cities that, uh, like I mentioned, um, currently you have like the city of London, which is a financial sector, Washington, D.C., which is the military sector, and then you have the Vatican. So there's three actual city states that are in countries, but they're not technically part of those countries. So the Vatican's in Italy, but it's not part of Italy. D.C. is in the United States, but it's not actually part of the United States. The city of London is inside London proper, inside of Link, uh, England, but it's not actually part of the country. 
So these three entities, they each fly their own flag. That lets you know they are little city-states, and they control a specific sector. So we did a video on that. I, I, I'd like you to go back and check those videos, but you know, we get you up to speed. But understand, whatever the system is at the end, that would be Mystery Babylon. So let's continue on and see what this video brings. The book of Revelation is a tapestry of vivid imagery and symbolism filled with complex and often mysterious visions that have intrigued and puzzled scholars for centuries. One of the most striking and enigmatic figures in this apocalyptic narrative is the harlot of Babylon, a woman adorned in scarlet and gold symbolizing opulence and decadence. She is depicted as a powerful seductress, drunk on the blood of the saints, representing the ultimate corruption and moral decay. Her story is a cautionary tale, a stark warning about the dangers of worldly power and the seductive allure of evil, which can lead to the downfall of entire civilizations. The harlot is not merely a literal woman, she represents something far more sinister and pervasive. She embodies a corrupt system, a global power that has turned its back on God, embracing greed and moral decay. This system is built on greed, idolatry, and the relentless pursuit of pleasure, often at the expense of spiritual values and ethical principles. Its influence is far-reaching extending to the very ends of the earth, affecting countless lives and shaping the course of history. The harlot's story is a vital part of understanding the end times as described in Revelation, offering insights into the ultimate battle between good and evil. She represents the forces of darkness that will rise up against God's people, challenging their faith and resilience. Her ultimate destruction is a testament to the power of God, and the victory of good over evil, a powerful reminder of the triumph of divine justice. The book of Revelation pulls no punches in its description of the harlot, a figure shrouded in mystery and malevolence. She is a captivating yet repulsive figure, a paradox of allure and revulsion. Her beauty is only skin deep, masking a heart full of wickedness and deceit. Her outward charm conceals an inner darkness that corrupts all it touches. She is called Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. This title alone evokes a sense of dread and foreboding. She is depicted as drunk, not on wine, but on the blood of the saints. This chilling image underscores her role as a persecutor. This symbolizes her persecution of God's people, her insatiable thirst for power fueled by the suffering of the innocent. Her reign is one of terror and oppression. Her wealth is immense, gained through exploitation and corruption. She thrives on the misery of others, amassing riches at a great human cost. She trades in cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, and pearls. Her influence extends far and wide, touching every corner of the earth. Fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth. These luxurious items symbolize her opulence and the seductive nature of her power. Her power is seductive, drawing kings and merchants into her web of deceit. They are lured by promises of wealth and influence. She promises them wealth and pleasure, but delivers only spiritual emptiness and ultimately, destruction. Her gifts are poisoned, leading to ruin. The harlot's story reminds us to be wary of worldly allurements, for they often mask a path leading away from God. Her tale is a cautionary one, urging vigilance and discernment. The harlot's true identity is a subject of much debate among biblical scholars. This enigmatic figure has sparked countless discussions and theories throughout the centuries. Some believe she represents a literal city, 
pointing to ancient Babylon as a historical example of a powerful and corrupt empire. They argue that Babylon's grandeur and eventual downfall serve as a cautionary tale for future generations. Others see her as a symbol of a future global superpower that will emerge in the last days. This interpretation suggests that the harlot embodies the ultimate manifestation of human ambition and corruption on a global scale. Still, others interpret the harlot as representing a religious system, a counterfeit faith that leads people astray from the true God. They believe she symbolizes the dangers of false teachings and the perils of spiritual deception. They point to her association with idolatry and her persecution of the saints as evidence of her apostate nature. This view highlights the harlot's role in leading people away from genuine faith and into spiritual ruin. Regardless of her precise identity, the harlot's characteristics paint a clear picture of a system opposed to God. Her actions and influence are seen as a direct challenge to divine authority and moral integrity. She represents the allure of worldly power, the seductive nature of wealth, and the danger of compromising faith for the sake of temporary pleasure. The harlot's story serves as a powerful reminder of the eternal conflict between spiritual values and material temptations. Okay, so um, we talked about Rome. We talked about uh, Jerusalem as being candidates. So why do I say that? Well, because uh, the, the Apostle John on the Isle of Patmos goes, goes into detail about this great city, you know, which is equated to the woman that rides the beast. And the key elements is that this woman was responsible for the blood of the saints. So remember, in John's experience, was it Rome? No. Who what great city was slaughtering the saints? Well, that would be Jerusalem, who, who also our Lord was crucified in, and that would be Jerusalem. So the Apostle John is seeing Jerusalem as he's prophesying about the woman decked in gold, which tells you that Jerusalem was a wealthy city. We, we, we don't get it. We see these movies in Hollywood as though Jerusalem was this impoverished place. No, it's like a forerunner to the banking system. The temple itself. That's why uh, the, the Messiah, Hamashiach, got so upset when he saw the money changers. Because that's, that's kind of what it was. They were, they were banking on, on the Shabbat, right, on the Sabbath. And so it was like a financial, but also a religious center at that time. Rome was the military center, but Jerusalem was the financial and religious center. I know you probably haven't looked at it that way or even thought of it that way, but let's make no mistake. The Apostle John is talking about Jerusalem. He's not talking about the Pope or the Vatican or anything of that nature because obviously the Pope and the Vatican and the, you know, the, the Christian or the Roman Catholic Church had, hadn't come about yet. He's not seeing them. He's, he's looking back at what he saw. That great city was Jerusalem. And that great city, our Lord and Savior was crucified in, right? And that's what he's talking about. Does that limit this to just one city? Because later on in history, what happens? Rome starts persecuting the saints, right? Rome becomes drunk off the blood of the saints. You see, this thing is starting to jump around here. And it's moving from... I know this sounds wild, but it's moving from east to west. That's what I'm, that's all I'm saying. It's heading west. Even the empires start heading west. I mean, you know, people don't think of it in those terms, but you know, the, the first empires start kind of in the, what we today call the Middle East. And they start slowly working their way west till you get to, you know, like uh, the Caliphate and I mean, the, the British Empire, you, you follow what I'm saying? And then there's another empire. They don't like calling themselves an empire, but make no mistake, 
It's an empire. And I think we may know what country that is today. It's an empire that rules, essentially rules the world, is being challenged right now. But watch what happens as the persecution starts to move west too. So the persecution was in the east, you know, so everybody ran to the west. But it's creeping that way now. So in the last days, who or what becomes that great city? I mean, I, I don't know, I'm speculating. I'm just speculating, but who or what becomes that great city? And if you think it's only Rome, or you think it was only Jerusalem, well, let's read the book of uh, Nahum. So I had to pull my Bible out, because um, you might hear my pages crackling a little bit. But I'm gonna read from the book of uh, Nahum, who was preaching, uh, you can look at the book of Nahum as uh, kind of the part two to the book of Jonah. Because remember, Jonah went to the city of Nineveh and preached repentance, and the people repented. And so judgment, they were spared judgment. And of course, Jonah got all upset about it, and, and, and Father Yah had to uh, console him, like, hey, you, you're you're upset because I didn't wipe out this city. You should be, you should look at it this way. Your mission was a success, dude. But Jonah wasn't taking it that way. You know, he went through all that trying to get away from preaching that message. Turns out he saved an entire city. You know, but Nahum is at a time where the city of Nineveh, the same thing except this time they don't repent, right? So this, he's preaching about Nineveh and the things they've done. And you have to understand the context. Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian Empire. And the Assyrians are notable because they swooped down and dismantled the nation of Israel and left Judah only. And, and Judah survived only because of uh, you know, the intervention of the Most High with his holy angel, right? And if you don't remember the story, um, he said his angel before the gates of uh, Jerusalem, over 185,000 Assyrian troops had besieged Jerusalem. I think it was for a couple of years. And uh, the king uh, earnestly prayed, I believe it was Hezekiah, uh, that, you know, he, he would spare uh, his people. And because Hezekiah, what the Most High said about Hezekiah was that of all the descendants of David that sat on that throne up to this point, Hezekiah was most reminded of, or most reminded the Most High of David. So he basically he was saying, Hezekiah, you, you remind me of your father David. That, you know, and what was it said about David? He was beloved. He was a man after Yah's own heart. And so here's Hezekiah, who's very similar to David, only in a different situation. And, and the Most High took mercy on him. Through, he prayed earnestly, and he said his angel about Jerusalem, and he said, this time tomorrow, all your enemies will be unalived, right? And come the morning, the entire camp of Assyrians was laid out. And so the Assyrians never conquer Jerusalem. They never conquer the nation of Judah or Yehuda, right? They conquered, they totally emaciated uh, Israel, the, you know, the 10 tribes, the northern 10 tribes. But by the time they get to, to Jerusalem, they get stopped. So there's a stone in the desert. Uh, it was called the Stone of Seneca, who was the ruler of of the Assyrians, and it's actually etched in the stone. He said, I had Hezekiah caged up like a bird, right? And it, it tells a little bit of the story. So yeah, so for all of you who think the Bible is just making stuff up, here's a stone, an ancient stone obelisk in the middle of the desert that's telling the same story that the scriptures are telling, except we know two things, or a couple of things. We know that they besieged Jerusalem, the Stone of Sennacherib confirms that. We know they marched all through the middle, what we call the Middle East, Northeast Africa, into you know Egypt and all that. They conquered everybody. 
except for Judah. The the Yahudim, for some strange reason, survived the Assyrians. But the Assyrians don't tell you why. And why would they? Because they were humiliated. In fact, they were so humiliated that when word got back to Assyria about how how they were wiped out at the gates of uh, Jerusalem, that gave the king's sons, who were wicked men, that gave them the impetus to overthrow their father because he was now perceived as weak. Sent all those men to their death. And so that gave them something to talk about. You know, Absalom did the same thing to King David, right? Pretty much. You focus on your father's weakness there, and then you overthrow him. So that's kind of what happened. He was overthrown and killed by his own sons. But of course, they weren't blessed either, as you don't you don't do that to your father and get away with it, right? So, so there's a lot of history here, and it's it's not made up stuff. It's real. It's very real. So, what happened to all of those troops? Why didn't the Assyrians conquer the uh, the nation of the Yahudi, the Yahudim? Why why did Judah stand when nobody else did? Well, the scriptures tell you. The Most High sent an angel and wiped them out. Okay, so we won't go into that too much. We, we'll get around back to that. But, you know, some people might say it was a, a, a outbreak, a plague or something. However it happened, it happened. And Assyria did not conquer the Jews. Okay, did not conquer the Yahudi. So, anyway, something to think about. Um, but I'm going to read from the book of Nahum. And I bring up Nineveh for a reason. Because Nineveh, although it's not accounted as a, a world empire, it was the, actually the catalyst for that frame of thinking and, and those systems. So uh, they, they have become a sinful people, as outlined in the book of Nahum, and they had become rich and powerful and were likened unto a harlot. Right? So let's read. Um, So we're in Nahum chapter 3 and verse, we'll start at verse 1. Woe to the bloody city. It is all full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not. The noise of a whip, yeah, and the noise of the rattling of the wheels of the prancing horses and of the bounding chariots. So it's a busy city, bustling. You know, the sound of the whip, that's like laborers have, you know, slavery, laborers laboring. I mean, what stuff you see in in any modern city. So it was a bustling metropolis. The horsemen lifted up up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there was a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. And there is no end of their corpses. So it was a very uh, wicked city. There was a lot of mayhem going on in there. A lot of murder going on there. Because of the multitude of, the, of thy harlot trees, of the well-favored harlot, the mistress of witchcraft that selleth nations through her harlot trees, and families through her witchcraft. So she's in the business of selling nations. Well, you could take that a few ways. Slavery is an obvious one. Um, today's slavery might not look like yesterday's slavery, but the, the outcome is the same. People not being free to pursue their, their happiness, essentially. You're, you know, today we might call it an employee, <laughs> whatever or nations that don't really rule the nations, like the presidents of these countries that are just puppets to other powers, you know. So she enslaves them through her harlot trees. Not just nations, but families. And you know, we can, we can put the, uh, the puzzle together, it's more than you think it is, but this, this city is famous for this. Behold, I am against thee, saith Yahweh Zebaoth, that is the Lord of hosts, 
and I will uncover thy skirts. I will expose you. That's what he's saying. From thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness, and the kingdoms thy shame. So, what that says to me, it seems that the fate of Nineveh, in this case, mimics the fate of the woman spoken of in the book of Revelations. Now, if you think about it, what, what happened to Nineveh is basically the same thing that happened to Jerusalem in 70 AD. You, you had a, a thriving, bustling city, financially wealthy, um, that was influencing the world, you know, and then it's destroyed, and I mean miserably destroyed. And in this case, Nineveh was destroyed by the Babylonians, and you could, you could, uh, you know, go into history and check uh, how that happened, but it was a miserable situation. Same with Jerusalem in 70 AD. So two cities that were called harlots were destroyed. But something tells me it doesn't end there. There's another city talked about in the last days that's going to mimic these two cities, and it shall also be destroyed. And I have a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> I might know what city that is, but you know, it, it is what it is. So that being said, um, you know, we, we, we kind of can identify the city, but nah. So remember, the city is representative of more, of more than just a city. It is the actual um, operating system of the beast system, especially in the last days. So, and that city shall be destroyed and burnt with fire. Now, that could also emanate out to an entire nation. That can emanate out to the system that was built by, that, that controlled the beast, right? But you do have to understand who the beast is in the last days and what, how, how it's being ran, what controls it. So based on that, you can kind of deliberate and figure it out. So we'll, we'll continue on um, and see what we can see. Uh, we want to do a dive deep into the fascinating and complex symbolism of the harlot in Scripture. In this video, we explored the significance of the harlot, her role in the book of Revelations, and how her imagery of the ten horns and the beast paints a vivid picture of power and moral decay. We also discussed the harlot's violent fate. That's the key. It will be burnt with fire and shredded. And I mentioned two cities that that did happen to. In the last days, there'll be another city that that will happen to. Could be one of the previous two cities, but I don't think so. I think there's a new city that's now considered the harlot that has the, the, the mindset and control that both Nineveh and Jerusalem had. The implications of her wealth and her portrayal as a powerful city dominating world rulers we're gonna, we gained insights into the metaphoric woman, her identity, or uh, her identity debates, and her relevance to end times, plus explored the role of Ashitan and the concept of rulers influenced by demonic powers. The scriptures mention the harlot numerous times throughout his writings, the fate of the harlot is outlined in the book of Revelations, and the ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. So they turn on this city, or this people, or this nation. As Revelations chapter 17, verse 16. In scripture, the harlot is usually described as a drunken, perverse, seductive, filthy, rich, uh, and sitting in the seat of power and influence. She's controlling things. And look at the state she's in. And yes, she's controlling everybody else. She is also described as a great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Revelation 17, verse 18. There has been much debate over the actual identity of this metaphoric woman 
We delved into the book of Nahum, the prophet, to uncover the truth about the harlot. In the last days, we will see that the woman is ultimately a description of the nation ruling the earth at the time of the end. So keep that in mind. All truth will be revealed. And it's not something the Most High is going to leave you clueless with in the end. Remember, Ashitan is the God of this world, and to whom he will, he can grant great authority and rulership, rulership to on the earth. These rulers are chosen because they have opened themselves up to demonic possession and have the mind of Ashitan, who was a liar and a murderer from the beginning. And so they continue, they continue with his programming. They go about the earth killing and maiming and stealing and robbing. And they, 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 look, they can look at themselves in the mirror and, and say, what? What did we do? You know? <laughs> well, ask the people you destroyed what you did. You know? Ask the leaders who, who, who you overthrown. Ask the, ask the governments you've overthrown. You know, it's, it's crazy. But the catch is when you dance with the devil, you must Pay the piper. And when you look into the abyss, just remember that abyss is looking back at you. So I'm pretty much going to close this out on this note. Nahum chapter 3, verse 5. Behold, I am against thee, saith Yahuwah Zebaoth, and I will discover thy skirts upon thy face, and I will show the nations thy nakedness and the kingdoms thy shame yeah you'll be burnt with fire and they will eat your flesh oh Babylon anyway that's all I got for today um, I thank you so much you guys have been great hope you, you learned something got something out of this I don't want to feel like I'm just talking to myself but even if I am I'm edifying myself then. <laughs> I love you all so much thank you so much for continually supporting my content if you did enjoy this video, hit the thumbs up button, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. And share this with your friends and family. I'm sure they'd find it interesting as well. I'm very excited to continue this journey with you. I thank you all for bringing certain stories to my attention and for continually keeping me updated with certain events around the world. And I very much appreciate you all. And shout out to the channel members. I really appreciate you guys supporting my channel. And I'll try to keep this coming. May everybody have a beautiful and blessed day who's in the body of Messiah Yahusha Hamashiach. And I'll see you on the next video. Shalom.